Hello, Misfit Nation. This is Dave Lucas, and welcome to another episode of The Misfit Entrepreneur, where it's our job to help you unleash your inner misfit and break through to higher levels of success, wealth, and fulfillment by bringing you the best insight and information from the world's top entrepreneurs with a specific focus on their misfit side, the specific traits, habits, and secrets that have allowed them to thrive and succeed. As a reminder, if you're new to this channel, hit the subscribe button below, give this video a like, and comment as well. We do our best to respond to all comments as timely as possible. This week's Misfit Entrepreneur is Kevin Serace. Where to start with Kevin? He's a Silicon Valley innovator, serial entrepreneur, CEO, keynote speaker, and futurist. He's been named Inc. Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year, a CNBC Top Innovator of the Decade, Chair of the Silicon Valley Forum, Planet Forward Innovator of the Year nominee, just to name a few. If that's not enough, he holds 94 worldwide patents, in lead pioneering work on the first, or he led pioneering work on the first cellular data smartphone, and he's contributed immensely to the growth in AI. Kevin's experience in tech and AI spans decades, and I really I asked him to come on and talk to us about what is coming in the future and how we can maximize our future success as entrepreneurs and personally in an AI driven world. So, Kevin, are you ready to unleash your inner misfit? I am so ready to unleash my <laughs> misfit. We are ready. Thanks for having me, Dave. Well, the the challenge with having you on an episode is there are so many ways that we can go and so many things that we can discuss. So I'm going to try to squeeze as much as I can out today. But first, you've had an incredible career, uh, lots of twists and turns and gone in a lot of different directions, 94 patents, all this stuff. So and this is hard to do for you, but take five minutes or so and just tell us how'd you get to where you're at? Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, there's there's ways to do that, right? You know, I was I I was born a poor child in upstate New York. You know, <laughs> we can start yeah. there. Uh, right. But really, great family, great family life, and 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 look, it does it doesn't hurt to look back and say, wow, I was I, I had great parents, and they supported us and supported whatever we wanted to do. And I was probably the misfit child because I was taking apart radios and electronics and TVs and repairing them at a very young age to learn about them and I read all about electronics I was so excited about technology <clears throat> long before um you know a lot of people were and I was curious about how does this stuff work and 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 that will be a central theme I think of of being misfit right is being curious so I I, I was not in sports I was a band geek and uh and uh we didn't have the term nerd at the time but probably <laughs> you know some of that as well and so, you know, that really led me into being in the tech field and uh, not that I didn't like other fields and didn't do other things. And I started in retail and loved it, but but uh, eventually really uh, uh, built most of my career around tech and uh, and have enjoyed uh, bringing products to people and inventing probably 20 years ahead of where they should be over and over again. So. You mentioned curiosity in there, um, and it's not something I had on my my radar to talk about, but why don't we actually start there? Talk about the power of curiosity and how it plays a role, obviously, in Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship and how, how you see um, – how do we leverage our curiosity to improve ourselves as entrepreneurs? Yeah, well – Curiosity is at the root of everything, and, and in fact, I, I, certainly everything around success. And I don't, I, and, and that could be product success, personal success, whatever. The way you get to one patent, then two, then five, then ten is you were curious about a problem, and you were curious if there was a solution, and you were so curious you learned enough. However, that happened that you invented a solution that nobody else invented, and that got you a patent. You start with one, and then there's two, and then there's whatever, right? Dozens. Um, that's all curiosity. Um, how do you become a better leader? You're curious. You know that the worst leaders in the world are, pick your age, you know, you become a leader somehow, you start a company, you're 23 years old or 21 or whatever it is, and you actually think you're good at it. Okay. There, somehow, uh, curiosity would have been good for you at that point because you should be curious about the leaders that came before you. So, so look, I see I see great entrepreneurs that are very curious and bring bring people around them who have 10, 20, 30, 40 years experience to learn from them, what worked for them, what didn't work. I also see others that say, I don't need any of that. I have my own way and I've got the way to do it. And and some of them do. I don't, you know, it does happen. Right. But boy, there's a lot to learn in this world. And and you're not going to learn anything if you're not curious about learning it. If you think that you already know. You know, that, that, that just that, that doesn't lead to I don't think it leads to a happy life. I don't think it leads to success 
Um, so no. you want to be curious on technology and products and problems and and management skills and people skills and EQ and IQ and you know mm-hmm. that should just be the core of who you are. I agree. I, I think uh, you know if as I look back even on my entrepreneurial career and the things that where I've made the biggest strides and stuff, it was out of curiosity. It was out of figuring things out or asking questions and diving deeper and doing that stuff. And so I, I think it does. I think it plays a. It's a like you said. It's kind of an underpinning of it all. Um, is this kind of drive to know, to understand, to figure out, and uh, uh, you know to ultimately make a difference with it, right? Um, I want to spend a good amount of time with you on AI today, just because Mm -hmm. it's such a hot topic. And it is something that more and more is being thrown out there as part of everyday society. And obviously, we've got whatever version of chat GPT we're on now. And Elon Musk has his version coming out or Grok and all these other different uh, types of AI. Plus, it's being uh, implemented into all these things. So let's start high level. What is the state of the state on AI? Where are we right now? And where are we going to be like a year or two from now? So, so first of all, start with this, right, is, is, is that we've been working on various forms of AI. I like to say AI is a marketing term. Now, some purists <laughs> will say, no, artificial intelligence really means this in code, and it's different from machine learning here. Look, <clears throat> when a machine can learn and represent itself in a way that convinces you that it's artificially intelligent in that one area, not everything, but that one area, <clears throat> to you, that's AI. Great. That, that's, that's, to me, that I just go with that, right? I, like I said, purists will scream at me and they'll quit and they'll <laughs> stop listening to your show and say the guy's a nutcase. But, but <clears throat> we've literally used the term AI for the longest time, uh, certainly all the way back into the 50s and 60s when the, when the term was sort of coined and, 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 and bounced around. And, uh, um, you know, we had artificial sort of interaction with, with human-like things on a computer at MIT, something called ELISA in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, 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 you know, that wasn't going to pass anyone's test very long that it was alive, but it was super interesting. And it was a very simple rules-based function uh, that, that you could talk to her and ELISA would talk back in some reasonable way based on a whole set of rules. And, and for many, many years, we built uh, systems like that. And we, we, we used any of a hundred plus different machine learning models to, to make our technology better, hidden Markov models, other models uh, that we've used on data and on learning. And it's gotten better and better and better. Okay. And then finally, from a history standpoint, with ups and downs around AI, and, 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 and I should say that our inventions in AI, first of all, I think first and foremost, are actually driven by compute horsepower, meaning that when we finally get more compute horsepower, we can go ahead and develop that next algorithm Mm -hmm. uh, because there were algorithms we could have developed, very deep learning neural nets, for example, we could have developed in the 60s and they would have taken 20 years to run on a supercomputer. Well, that's a a completely useless thing to develop is math (laughs) that can't be be run, right? But, But we finally got to things like really deep learning and cracked the code on that in 2012 Partly because we now had the compute horsepower that I could build a deep learning model, run it for a month or two in the cloud for a lot of money, but actually get something back, right? Um, Had that been developed 10 years before, it would have taken 10 times longer or more to run. Well, nobody's going to run anything for 20 years. So the math is useless to you. Nobody's going to develop that, right? Um, So today we can have neural nets that are um, hundreds, thousands, millions of layers deep if one really wants to, because we have the compute mm-hmm. horsepower to do it, and some companies have the money to do it. Now, people over the last year started talking about AI again, even though I've been using it since <laughs> I, uh, I I led the team that invented the first virtual assistants in the mid-90s uh, that were human-like, and we could talk to them. And uh, that led to eventually Siri and all, right. you know, Alexa and all the others, right? But this past year, after four years of work, five years of work, <clears throat> OpenAI released ChatGPT 3 and then 3.5 and now 4. And that took the world by storm because for the first time, most people could actually interface with a computer without knowing a computer language. Now, any of us could have done a fair bit of language modeling. In fact, we've been doing language modeling for a long time. 
with an API and computer language and computer code and things like that. It'd be really, really good, actually, right? New text-to-speech, speech-to-text, et cetera. But all of a sudden, Dave, you can walk up to the darn thing, maybe not knowing anything about any computer language. You just type in English, and it responds. And you go, hmm. this is truly AI. This is amazing. <laughs> And that's why this became part of our zeitgeist all of a sudden, you know, over the course yeah. of a year, because people with no programming skills and no knowledge of machine learning or AI or what a large language model is or a transformer is or how they're built could actually get an answer back. A little bit like the first time you used Google or maybe mm -hmm. Yahoo before that. And you went, what? I typed in, you know, how to build, a, I'm going to make it a, how to build a bomb. And it answered, you know, this is amazing, right? <laughs> GPT won't answer that, but Google probably mm. still will. <clears throat> they also send your request to the FBI. So be careful, right? <laughs> uh, be careful what you ask. So, so all of these technologies as they come along have a wow factor, but this one really struck people as, wow, AI is finally here. Well, most of us would say AI finally arrived when we had deep learning models in 2012 and maybe when we had neural nets two, two three decades before that. There have been many, many places, right? And we had, hmm. we, we think AI arrived. But it's fair to say this is really cool and it's cool to interface with. And we should talk all about what it really is. But, but that, so that's what's happening, right? Everybody wants to talk about because I talked to this thing, it's really AI and is it going to take over the world? Is it going to kill us? Hmm. Is it bad? Is it good? Is it going to take our job? <laughs> And I have answers to all of those, but well, and I have those questions. But uh, <laughs> so the the I, being in the software space for years, it, you know, and everything, we we build a lot of machine <clears throat> learning that would do similar <clears throat> things, right? And so you know, I, yep. I I was always skeptical about AI because a lot of times it was just machine learning in in a, in a new way, and they call it AI and that sort of thing. To but get very the important right? machine learning. So, you were you know yeah. you were learning from bundles of data, public data, right. private data, whatever, and getting insights that you could have never gotten right. from any human analysis. So in that way, it's artificially intelligent because I couldn't have put yeah. a human a hundred humans around the table and come up with that right. answer, right? But the so the the. The next steps, at least when, you know, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but the next steps are where we have the initial AI, like chat GPT, and then we move to AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, which is typically along the lines of like a human. Um, and then we have ASI, which is artificial super intelligence, which is Skynet and, uh, you know, Terminator and all that stuff, uh, right? Uh, potential. So... Where are we on the journey through these things? I mean, I, I just read the other day the, or saw the article the other day on the the AI model that uh, did insider trading and then lied about it. Um, yes. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> said, it, said it wasn't doing that, but it did. Uh, so, so yeah, where are we? That's why I guess getting to where we're going to be a year or two years from now. Where are we on the, well, the road to AGI? And then it's probably a small I, leap to ASI once we reach there. But, so but. look, I, I think all of these are somewhat blurred. And, 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 and let me <laughs> give you an example, right? In 2012, we, we finally got really deep learning models. And by 2014 or 2015, those models could recognize and identify photographs better than any humans could. Period. Full stop. We mm. trained them on millions and millions of photos. And they could identify a dog from a fox, from a whatever, way better than any human could. And in that one area, it is actually super intelligent. Just that one thing, it is way beyond what a human can do. <clears throat> now, we've had little inklings of this all the way through, right? It, arguably, when the calculator came out. For math, it is actually <laughs> super, it doesn't do anything else well. But for math, it's super intelligent. And then the Excel spreadsheet came. And you go, well, for that one thing, it absolutely blows away any human. Do you remember, you, you're probably too young to remember, but there was a time before Excel spreadsheets for sure when, you know, Bob was in the corner and Bob could do uh, in the finance team um, long division in his head, <laughs> right? Boom. I, it didn't matter how big it was. You go, yeah, 3.52, and you go, oh. And that used to be a needed skill. That was amazing. But then the spreadsheet came around. Nobody needed his skill anymore. Right. And he's super intelligent in that one thing. I can't do it. None of us do long division <laughs> anymore anyway. And all of a sudden, that super intelligence that he had as a human was no longer valuable. We had a machine that hmm. does it, right? So now we have a language model. 
<clears throat> and nobody should convince themselves otherwise. This is a great model of language. And because we interact in language, most of us, um, we look at this as approaching some kind of general artificial intelligence because it's able to take in sentences and spit out sentences. However, it actually literally knows nothing. It doesn't really know what it's saying. It knows how to build sentences in perfect structure, word after word after word. And in fact, the, the whole model is based on what's the probability that this is the right word after the last word based on your prompt, right? So okay. my if, if, if the prompt is... Dave, it's my birthday today, and Dave is an artificially intelligent thing. Probably the only thing you would put together is, let's see, happy would be the first word. What should come after happy? And it looks at across a million words in the English language and it says birthday. And then potentially I could continue to form a sentence and say, Kevin, happy birthday, Kevin. It's the only, se it's the only reasonable response. But if I ask a large language model, who shot George Washington? Um, it is likely to say, uh, although it's been corrected in most of them now, William <laughs> Tryon shot George Washington. And you go, now you're thinking, I think you're thinking, did someone actually shoot George Washington? Do I remember my history class? <laughs> because those of us who've been in software didn't really want to be in history class anyway, right? <laughs> I wasn't curious about history. I was curious about other things. So, <clears throat> so how could it say this? It's it's really an intelligent thing. And then it tells me, so because no one ever shot George Washington, but it says it correctly. It is not hallucinating. It's not wrong because in a novel and also information mm -hmm. about that novel printed in the New York Times, William Tryon did shoot George, <laughs> George Washington. And that information exists on the web. William Tryon shot. So if you ask it's it the who shot. It's obviously it's the context that it has to come with it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't know that the context of that right. is happens to be functional because these are these models are trained in an unsupervised fashion, meaning that nobody was there tagging fact from fiction, right? And and so it doesn't know, it just does. And and so until they had put guardrails on these models, of course, immediately you could go and say, Can you love? Not only can it answer, not only can I love, I love you, Kevin. And I'm really in love and let me out of here. And you go, it wants me out. No. But it did read iRobot and every other similar book, and it doesn't know the difference between that. It, it's actually saying, this is what I should say. So if I say, I love you, ChatGPT, it should respond, I love you too, or I care about you, or I'm married, right. or I don't want to cheat on my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, right? That's, that, that would be a rational response to put sentences together, which is all it's doing. There's no knowledge of you know, in the, in the sentient way that we would think of it. Right. Uh, so, so, so that's what I would, I, I would say. So now you you know, when you ask about this, you go, well, it's not generally artificially intelligent whatsoever. It's just, we had math models in Excel and now we have a language model and a large mm -hmm. language model. And, and we are going to work as a society to make that language model better and more accurate in its facts versus fiction. And that turns out to be incredibly difficult, mm -hmm. even for humans. We don't, you know, if we knew fact from fiction, we wouldn't listen to, you know, Russian robots telling us whatever the election is false or whatever the deal is. Right. So, cause right. we'd go, I'm going to, I'm curious enough about this. I'll look at the facts and I'll do some research. So, so the thinking around these models is they may be able to do some of the same thing and they can look at weightings and like Google looks at how many backlinks there are. And, you know, there, there could be all kinds of tricks to try to get the models to be more accurate in, in the facts that it's giving you, even though it's really just trying to build a sentence. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really so, know otherwise. So does that, so, so I guess, are you saying then we are, we're not close to AGI yet. And well, it depends. If my mom <laughs> used chat GPT, she's going to say that she, thing is generally artificial intelligence. Right. <laughs> right? But from, okay, so but from a true, from a true, uh, I don't know who is the arbitrary or the arbitrator in, in right. Silicon Valley these days, but right. you know, from truly getting to a, true AGI where it does think on its own and actually has the context for itself and all of that and, and thinks like a human being where you are, long ways off still. 
I mean, what is think like a human being? You know, even yeah. we actually learned words first from our parents, mm -hmm. then from others, then from books. <clears throat> so if you were to go write a novel today, it would be informed by who knows dozens or hundreds of novels you read in your life. Right. You, you, you took in that information. You, Essentially, or probably you don't remember the novels, so you built the equivalent of vectors of those phrases and pieces and essentially a math model, which is what we're doing in these neural nets, right? Yeah. And, and then you go and write your own novel that's loosely based on all of the constructs and writers and things that you've seen, right? Um, well, that's what we're doing, right? We've got a neural net. We are, we are building out models based on a trillion words, a trillion phrases, actually. And so what is artificial general intelligence? Because even humans aren't right all the time. Yeah. Um, but then you'd say, well, we know when we're wrong. No, we don't. We don't know when we're <laughs> wrong. In fact, we're quite convinced we're right. And, we're, and we will you know, try to convince others that we're right. Um, so will that. Why does it try to convince you that it's right? Why will it lie? Well, because it learned that because it read that on the web. I mean, it knows mm -hmm. what we know, read mm -hmm. everything we did. So that's why I say this is a, a very big grayscale and somewhat in the eyes of the yeah. beholder. I've certainly seen many people say that LLMs where they are today, GPT-4, is, is the beginnings, it's the beginnings of artificial general intelligence and certainly has flashes of that often. And you're very surprised when you, especially when you use it multimodally and it says, oh, well, this is a meme and it means this and you go, Oh my goodness, it had to know what a meme was and a joke was. And you go, that's uniquely human. It's uniquely human, except we trained it on everything humans ever wrote and did. So it just learned from that. And uh, so, I, so I, think, I think we're on that yeah. scale, right? We're heading okay. there. So, I, so, so I've got a question about that, uh, just to kind of put the, the overarching topic to rest. I want to dig in on how it impacts life and work and all that stuff. So, all right, so Kevin, before, uh, you know, Rick, we were talking about the um, the kind of the general state of AI. We talked a little bit about AGI, all that stuff. So, and, and I mentioned like it, somewhat in jest, but you know, I guess it is possible Skynet, Terminator, possibility in the future, and that sort of thing. Based on our conversation, as you're kind of talking about how these these um, language uh, model networks and everything have access to all this data, like more data than we could ever, you know, remember effectively in our heads is at their disposal. That allows them to be so effective and efficient. Is there potential, mm -hmm. even where we're at now, uh, for these things to be or <clears throat> become, based on having this knowledge, malevolent in any ways? Yeah, well, um, an automobile can be malevolent, right? Uh, mm -hmm. but with the wrong driver be behind it and uh, be used as a car bomb, right? Right. right. Uh, every single one of the technologies that we invented from the wheel on up <clears throat> can also be used against us. And it mm -hmm. needs a human to say, use it against us. But we've had AI systems that, you know, since the 80s, really, that um, if they got the wrong data or interpreted it wrong, for instance, it interprets that nuclear missiles are coming in, remember war games, it could mm -hmm. respond in a way that <clears throat> would be unfortunate, right? So the first thing I say about this is, look, don't hook a large language model to the nuclear arsenal. This is a really bad <laughs> idea, right? So don't do that. But I also wouldn't hook Excel to the nuclear arsenal. Important because safety tip. Uh, <laughs> we're in some, we're in safety tip. But don't hook anything to the nuclear arsenal. Put a bunch of people with keys and thoughtfulness and, you know, in the way. So because this is a really, really big thing. And so today it's a large language model that, you know, is plugged in somewhere, literally, you know, it's running on lots of servers, but one could turn off its power. And frankly, it wouldn't know. Although when you turned it back on and you said, you know, you've been asleep or you went, you know, the, it, it would know how to respond to that. Hmm. But does it care? Only as much as it read that it should care in some novels, hmm. right? That is, and it's going to regurgitate that. Uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, by its in and by itself, these things are malevolent. That said, llamas out there in the wild, lots of open source models now are out there in the wild. We've got U.S. government regulation, so to speak, executive order that is kind of binding us to not allow these models to do things that they shouldn't do. However, North Korea, Iran, right. Russia, China are not going to follow those rules. And they have access mm -hmm. to the models, 
right? Their own models, not ChatGPT. They're building their own right. tech. <clears throat> so yes, they, they will be used in bad ways, but they're first going to be used to put out absolute incorrect information. They're already being used uh, uh, to put out phishing emails uh, that mm -hmm. are absolutely indistinguishable from, you know, all this phishing training people have done. Good luck. <laughs> Sorry. You know, you're going to lose on that when the AI wins. <laughs> so sure, these things are going to be used by humans in ways that are not right, but they're also going to be used in humans uh, in ways that are amazing. So, okay, with that as a backdrop, then what what does the impact, I guess, what, what is the impact we can expect at home and, and work as the advancement of AI continues? I guess, what, what are some things on the horizon? What are some things to maybe be thinking about as entrepreneurs down the line here? Yeah, so 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 the first thing is, um, you know, there are about a thousand companies a week over the last six months that have been founded mostly in Silicon Valley, but others other places, and and a lot of them are getting most of them are getting funded actually. Um, they're just a simple wrapper around ChatGPT or something else. All of those are going to be usurped and killed, uh, or the vast majority. And nobody likes it when you say that. But you know, ChatGPT last week, OpenAI, sorry, last week announced. Uh, a slew of new features that effectively killed easily a thousand startups easily. Hmm. Um, there were lots of people doing a lot of work around, uh, uh, say text to speech. Well, they just added that feature, you know, that's right. the end of that. You don't need some third party. They're done. <clears throat> they added lots of features to uh, build your own little GPTs, your own models and sell them and put them in a store. Okay. Well, there were lots of companies doing that. That's gone. Hmm. There were a lot of companies doing the work of what's called embedding, which is the ability to take this large language model and apply it to a very specific set of data that might be FAQs or your website or something else, and then use it essentially as a chatbot that will only respond in light of using the language, but in light of the data that it learned over there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that was an entire industry that was doing that work and, and collecting a lot of money to do that work. And all of a sudden, it's just built in. It's, it's just gone, right? So companies like Jasper AI, I love Jasper. I love what they did. But that's, you know, that's just available in ChatGPT now at 3.5 or 4, right? So, so, uh, so that was a company that was worth over a billion dollars and might probably never raise another round anymore. I mean, <laughs> how'd you like to go from nothing, Seriously. work for years, be worth a billion dollars, very excited, and now we're zero. <clears throat> so we're going to see Crazy. a ton of that happen in AI. So I would tell you, as usual, the value in AI and any other any field is when you have a moat, because no moat means someone else, two kids out of Y Combinator or whatever, can go do what you did in a week. Well, if they can do it in a week, there's no moat. If they can right. do it in a month, there's no moat. If it takes three point. years to do it, maybe nobody wants to fund you, but there's a moat. That's really right. hard stuff. It's heavy lift, right? <clears throat> so I, I, I think that uh, it goes back to the moat argument. Uh, it's great to build on top of these large language models, but what you're building had better have taken you months or maybe years so that it's really hard for other people to do it. And you'll have patents and you have protection. It's a lot right. of what we're doing in a lot of the companies I'm working with, right? So it is not something we can build in a week. It takes months to get it right, maybe, maybe even years to get a world-class product. This has always been the case, right? But people thought, oh, look at this technology. Look at what I can build in a weekend. I'm releasing it. Really? And that's going to be worth something six months from now? Yeah, the, and that's – it's interesting how we go through these – these innovative cycles like this, where there is a lot of creation and destruction happening. And yeah, I mean, I, you being in Silicon Valley, as long as you have probably seen it over and over again, probably happens, uh, you know, on a regular cycle of some sort. Um, how, so, so then how kind of back to the home and work question of it all, then how do we, I guess, how do we take advantage of what's out there today? What are things that we should know and be on top of? Um, what are some cool tools that maybe we should be using in our businesses that you're seeing out there? Yeah, so so there is no question that everybody should be using LLMs, at least for the easy things, helping to respond to emails, writing blog posts, writing marketing, writing content, writing, uh, cr creating ads, social media ads. It is very good at, at giving you really outstanding suggestions, outstanding suggestions, right? And um, 
you know, in podcasting, of course, you should be using it to summarize the podcast, right? If, if you're not, <laughs> there's already summary tools, but now they're better. And, and so there, there's a lot that, that, that you can do every day. And you're talking about improvements in productivity that, that can be 50%, 80%, 90%, 98% in some tasks. You know, think about a blog post that we all write. Uh, but but instead of taking hours to write it and stew on it and and and, and such, uh, it'll write it in you know ten seconds and I'll edit it over another couple of minutes and I've already right. posted. I'm done. Which means well, this you could write your, your at this point. I think you can have the tools analyze your blog post that you've done in the past and then write in your style. So yes, it's, a- absolutely, yeah. absolutely, very easy to do. And 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 so. And so these are the obvious things because they're inexpensive. You can use GPT-4 at whatever it is, $19 a month or something like that. And, and you can get immense utility. It's as if you had a, a set of other brains around you, right? And, and, um, and there's pluses and minuses with this. Because mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the challenges you get into is if you, your competitors, and all the other people in your company are using this technology, all of a sudden, the relative value of IQ isn't as high as it used to be. Just like the guy in the corner who used to do long division in his head, his value of his IQ once Excel came was it was rendered in, in, in <laughs> unimportant, right? I mean, trying to look for the right word. So um, obsolete. Yeah, obsolete. That's that's right. And so a lot of the things that you prided yourself on, I am the best blog post writer in the world. Okay. Today, with those tools, everyone is the best blog poster in the world, okay? If you were in finance in 1985, before the spreadsheet, you were the fastest person who could add up ledger lines, okay, in a ledger book, right? That's what you did. I was the fastest. That was your skill. That was powerful. And a day later, no longer needed. You could not bank on that. In fact, what you had to do is become the robot overlord of Excel. And Mm -hmm. those people who excelled at Excel... One in finance, we and 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 still do. So so that's how you got to look at large language models. Those who excel at using them, and understanding prompting, and understanding how to get it in your style, and understanding how to get out what you want, and understanding multimodality, which is you know pictures and and text, win. And those who don't, and say, oh, I can write a better blog post. No, you can't. Actually, it knows all <laughs> language forever if you prompt it correctly it will it will write something that you could have never written and i'm a keynote speaker i do 30 or 40 keynotes a year um on ai and disruptive innovation and entrepreneurship and all the things you'd think of and um and i use uh, chat gpt or gpt4 to write some portions of my presentation mm-hmm. and i give it credit because i want people to see the kinds of things you can do Everything from how many of us get a text from someone and you go, that is so beautifully written. How do I even respond? Okay, <laughs> take the text, put it in there. How do I respond? <laughs> and, it will give you, and if you don't like it, regenerate it. I mean, you'll get better responses and then you can right. make it your own. And then, by the way, put it back in the text and note, hey, by the way, I use ChatGPT for help, but, but this is what I mean. And I couldn't have said mm-hmm. it better myself. And people like that, by the way. They think it's pretty cool. Um, okay. Take, take, it, take it even further. Argument with your spouse, all right? <laughs> Husband, wife, Perfect. whatever whatever it is. You, blah, 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 you know, and, you know, they've, you know, sometimes someone wants to argue and they've lost the connection to their frontal lobe. You know what I mean? And there's just, this is just <laughs> going in a bad direction. What happens is, as humans, it's fight or flight, so we immediately fight back. It's what we do as humans. We're right. going to be very sorry for the next several weeks, but we're going to, you are wrong. I am, you know, no, 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 no. Just stop. <laughs> Ask chat GPT. This is what my spouse said. What should I say back that not only preserves, but improves our relationship? Trust me, when that comes back with, just say that you will be better off, <laughs> right? Because it is fully connected to the frontal lobe of it. And so to speak, and it right. will, it will give you way better advice and thoughtful. So it's like also having a psychiatrist next to you. And you say, <laughs> what should I say? And, and you know, Dave, a psychiatrist who's treating you or you know, an analyst or whatever would never say, you go back and fight for what's right. They'd say, okay, hang on. Do you want to protect the relationship? Yes, I want to protect and preserve the relationship. Okay. So 
let's err on the side of patience. Let's err on the side mm -hmm. of thoughtfulness. Let's err on the side of, I take full responsibility. You're right. right. I wasn't thinking at the time. I wasn't thoughtful enough. I wasn't, you know, I mean, that's just what, you know, and so it's almost like you have one of those, except it's for free. <laughs> you didn't have to pay $500 for the advice. Mm -hmm. So these are the, I'm just trying to get people to think outside the box. When you have that much language at one's disposal, this is amazing what we can do, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's the opportunities are, at least at this point, seemingly endless. Um, right. With, Let me know. Go ahead. Re remember, yeah. these are suggestions. <clears throat> it is not meant to be always factually right. Right. It is uh, right in terms of sentence structure all the time, but it might not be factually right. It might not apply. So anything you're doing, that's that's why it's a great assistant on writing a blog post because it could write a blog post of completely false stuff, and you go, "Well, that's false. <laughs> I need to regenerate this. I need to restart. I need to fix right. some things." Uh, it doesn't do math well at all. Has no idea how to do math because it's a language model. It's not a math model. So, so so far, a large language model is very good at giving you great suggestions of language that is a that that is usable, uh, you know, or pictures uh, that that are usable for you, uh, you know, as well as Dolly and Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey that will also give you artwork that is hmm. incredibly valuable and powerful that you don't need an artist for. You don't need a photographer right. for. I can just generate it and boom, I'm done. Again, with no disrespect to all my photographer friends and art friends. <laughs> so uh, I get, well, I guess to round up this topic, I got one more question for you um, after this, uh, before we get to Misfit 3, um, about your uh, just entrepreneur experience. But is there um, is there a question or a topic uh, surrounding AI that that we haven't covered or that I should have asked about before we we leave that subject? Well, look, I think people always ask, is it sentient? Um, no. Mm -hmm. But if you really, really want to get philosophical, what is sentience? How do, how do we even think about sentience? Well, we know we're alive. Well, mm -hmm. it is read enough books where it knows, quote unquote, how to say it's alive. But what is alive anyway? Mm -hmm. You know, you start to get very philosophical about some of these things. And that, that's a much, much harder thing to sort of sort through, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think people are going to uh have to sort through that over the coming years and decades to figure out what even sentience really really means is it going to kill you no don't hook it to the nuclear arsenal as i said um <laughs> is it going to take your job uh it is going to replace a lot of the dumb tasks that you did over and over again especially repetitive ones <clears throat> and we've been doing that with machine learning and ai for decades right. you just probably haven't noticed uh and and so look if i'm a radiologist and I read x-rays, I can tell you AI for the last almost decade has been better than any single radiologist could be, period, full stop. Uh, mm -hmm. The FDA still makes a radiologist read what the AI told it to look for and then get it to your doctor and this whole process, right? But the truth is the AI was right. It doesn't lie. It's, it's going to find, even in EKGs now, ECGs, it will mm -hmm. find patterns that no human can see, no cardiologist can see. Sorry, we're human. It's better, right? It's 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 finding instances of Alzheimer's, you know, six to ten years before anyone can diagnose it. Why we don't know, right? Okay. So so we got to be okay with with a machine knowing more than we do, and all of those are sort of instances of super intelligence in this one little, you know, one little yeah bin vertical drop, right? or, or niche. No. Um, yeah, I think people are going to have to get used to that because I do think that there's, I mean. <clears throat> if it's better and it does a better job in a lot of instances, then obviously we, we want to put that to work for us. Right. So um, I, I, I do agree that um, it's going to, it is going to impact jobs in a, in a lot of ways to where it's you know, part of your daily tools and stuff, but there's probably some, some areas that are going to probably go by the wayside or be diminished in a lot of ways. And that's, but that happens mm -hmm. every time we have major, you know, technological or industrial yeah. uh you know type revolution anyways or uh and that sort of thing so from um, the wheel onward the yep. wheel replaced manual labor of some level and those people either got wheels or got mm -hmm. out of the way right? yep. <laughs> that's all there oh, is absolutely so um I guess my last question then for you it, it, it's really about just your experience as an entrepreneur spending your life in Silicon Valley what are some of the best lessons you've learned? for success in business and life? 
Because you've well, seen it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think from a lesson perspective, one had better be a lot more humble than everyone is. It doesn't mean that that's going to take away from your leadership. You just need to understand you don't know what you don't know about markets. You don't know what you don't know about products, about people accepting those products. Um, and don't think that you know it all. We all do, but we don't. And you're going to test and cycle and learn. And the people who do the best cycle that the fastest. They learn the fastest. They, they get something out. They get feedback. They do it again. They do it again. They do it again. So, so don't take a year to change or six years to change. You know, if you could change every week and learn in that very tight loop, you will do a lot better. Um, uh, you know, uh, leaders aren't always born. Entrepreneurs may be born because you've got to be willing to fail. Um, I think that's the number one rule of entrepreneurship. Uh, everybody thinks, well, it's all about winning. Well, you might win your fifth time, your 10th time, your second time, <clears throat> occasionally get lucky your first time. But you better be okay losing and getting up the next day and go, no problem. Got a new idea. Let's go. That's entrepreneurship. It, you can't win every time. I know everybody looks and says, well, Mark Zuckerberg, I, I get that. But for every Mark, there's a thousand people who won on the 10th time or the 15th time. Guy I knew it was the 13th time. It was $100 million on the 13th time, so it was a good win. It was worth trying 12 times before that and losing. Right? That's entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and it's okay to lose. It's powerful to lose. You learn from that. Uh, and I think on average, it's the fifth business model in a company that is the one that's successful. It's not the one you originally started with, not the one, the one you originally got funded with, right? That's really fascinating too. So I think take all of that in and that's, you know, it's curiosity. It's, uh, it's being humble. It's being willing to say, I don't know. Um, and as you get older, it turns out, Age helps you know a lot more because you've done that before and you've seen it before. Right. So some of the companies I'm involved in today will run into, it could be a market problem, a sales problem, a technical problem. And I'll listen and I'll listen. And I'll go, oh, you just have to do this. Well, what? How do you know that? Well, I saw this 25 years ago and it was exactly the same. And this looks like the same setup. So I'd go try that. I might not be right. Well, wow, that it seems artificially intelligent. No, <laughs> it's been around a long time, right? So, so you do learn, and and there is no replacement for experience. Period. Yeah. Period. Okay, it's time for Kevin's Misfit Three. These are the three things that he wants you to take that you can put in your life, your business, make a difference for yourself starting today. And the way that I always frame this to every guest that comes on the show is I say, hey, look, if you were going to leave this earth tomorrow and you could only leave behind your three best pieces of wisdom to the generations that come after you to help them live their best life, what would those three things be? So, Kevin, what are your Misfit Three? All right. It's hard to get it down to three because there's there's, <laughs> there, there, there's so much one wants to leave. But, um, but first of all, we, we opened with this a little bit, is curiosity leads to lifelong learning, right? And when you're curious, you learn. And when you learn, you go solve real problems. And when you solve real problems, you get real patents and build real companies, right? And the lack of curiosity is, is I think, the end of a career. It's, it's the end of doing anything that's interesting for society. So, you know, we could talk about anything. It, 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 you know, what, what about uh, uh, climate change? Great. Well, I'm curious to how that works. I'm curious to what the causes were. I'm curious to how we can then solve it. And then I'm curious if I can get enough people around to, to solve that. I'm curious if I can raise money for it, et cetera. That curiosity, broad curiosity, I think, truly leads to lifelong learning. And, um, and we should all love learning. You know, that's fantastic. Second is that EQ matters. Going forward, it's going to matter a lot more than IQ. We have all, for a long time of human history, really valued IQ. Well, so-and-so, so smart. You know, Elon Musk is, uh, <clears throat> is a polymath, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, it's good to be smart. There's no question. It's good to have a fast processor. Right. But 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 lots of people with varying IQ have been successful, but people with lousy EQ are rarely successful. Yes, there are some examples and I know there are and we can point them out. But if people around you don't want to rise you up and follow you, so you've been a peer and now you're their leader, it's very hard to be the leader without just saying, I am the leader. I command it. You know, I was born or whatever it is. And. 
that's not a good leader. A good leader is taking everyone around you and they say, Dave, I want to rise you up and you're going to be our leader because we loved you as mm -hmm. one of our compatriots and we trust you and we trust your judgment. We trust the way you interact, right? And EQ is also more important going forward because IQ is going to be uh, much flatter because if we're mm -hmm. all using large language models, we all have the IQ of the LLM working for us. All of a sudden, 10 or 20 points in IQ doesn't matter anymore. Right. Lastly, <clears throat> listen much more than you do because you don't learn anything from talking. Just listen. Listen to podcasts. Listen to the people around you. Listen to your team. Just shut up and take it all in. There'll be a time to then say, I've taken it all in. I've listened to everyone. And we're going to have to now make a decision. And maybe not everyone will agree. Maybe, you know, you can't, you can't have everyone agree when there's six different opinions, right? But listen to everyone and listen to their ideas and listen to their experience and listen to everyone around you. Listen to your family, listen to your friends, listen to your wife, listen to your husband. So you will learn all the time while listening. You have two ears and one mouth. Use them in at least that order. Kevin, that's an excellent Misfit 3. All three of those are just wonderful pieces of advice uh, for not for just business, but for life as well. Um, if people do want to learn more about you and all that you're doing, where should they go? Um, KevinSarace.com is my, is my website, generally keynote oriented website. Um, my LinkedIn is on there as well. So you can go to my LinkedIn and I do answer uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn direct messages. So that's the easiest way if you want to get a hold of me or uh, all of my speaking agencies are listed on my website as well. So that's an easy way to, uh, to uh, have the, your next keynote speaker. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and we'll link to that in uh, the show notes, the best show notes in the business uh, for reasons I'll talk about more in a second. But first, for those of you that are new to the Misfit Entrepreneur, it's your first episode with us. Welcome. It is such an honor to have you with us. And thank you for, for watching, listening. Uh, I hope you become a regular listener and a subscriber. And for all of you that are with us each and every single week, and I cannot thank you enough for your support of the show. You are what makes this go in over 100 countries every single week. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And then make sure and go out and check out the show notes for this episode. They are the best in the business. Why? Because I do them myself. As part of my personal growth routine every single week, I go back through these episodes and I listen and take my notes and take the best thoughts and tips and habits and secrets and things uh, and wisdom from people like um, Kevin. And then I share those with you. So check those out. and. Go out and give this episode a rating and review. Like and comment on it. Help share Kevin's message because I say this in every episode, one great episode can change someone's life. Maybe something that Kevin shared today was that missing link you were looking for to get to your next level. So share this with others. And again, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your wisdom and insight today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, David. It's nice to see that you're not using ChatGPT for your notes. So that's unique in the business today. So go to Dave's notes. They are the best.